Lighthouses descend from an ancient concept. The Egyptians, Phoenicians and Greeks all built towers to house beacons. Over time, these buildings developed to include more technology. Nowadays, they either mark dangerous places for rocks or to guide ships into safe harbours. For example, at Tynemouth, the lighthouses on the north and south piers mark the entrance to the River Tyne. The piers also help to guide any ships away from the Black Mins, a dangerous rock formation at the river mouth. Indeed, five ships wrecked on the rocks in just three days in 1864. But lighthouses are strange places at the best of times. They're often isolated from the mainland and we can only reach them at low tide, making them very lonely places. Lighthouse keepers live there, but lighthouses aren't workplaces, which undercuts any sense of domesticity. But lighthouses can also be incredibly creepy places. Just look at the film The Lighthouse. So in this instalment of our Folklore of the Sea series, let's check out some lighthouse legends in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello then. Welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Dicey Sedgwick. We are continuing with our theme of the folklore of the sea, and we are going to be having a look at some lighthouse legends. Now, lighthouses, as I said in the introduction, are fairly weird places at the best of times, and it's quite interesting because my dad's been doing some genealogy, and apparently we've had at least two that I can think of lighthouse keepers on his side of the family anyway. So it did seem quite interesting to then be having a look at some lighthouse legends. Now, obviously, as I'm sure you can appreciate, there are quite a lot of lighthouses, particularly around the British Isles, but also around other parts of the world as well. And trying to decide which ones to do became quite difficult because I think I'd only done three at one point and this was already going to be quite a long episode. So I thought, you know what, I'll just narrow it down somehow. So we're going to have a look at one from Wales, Scotland, England and Ireland because that seemed the easiest way of doing it. So we're going to start off with Wales and the Smalls Lighthouse tragedy and this really sad incident had a massive impact on how lighthouses worked around the British Isles. So we're going to travel back to 1801 and Thomas Griffith and Thomas Howell worked at the Smalls Lighthouse, which is 20 miles off the Pembrokeshire coast. And the lighthouse actually dated to 1776 and was built on the Smalls rocks. Now, by all accounts, the men seemed to really, really, really intensely dislike each other. They often fought and people knew of the animosity between the pair. You would think that they were badly suited to working together. So Howell ran into a problem when Griffith was involved in a freak accident and became seriously unwell. Howell had no means of calling for help, and weeks later, Griffith finally died. Now, panic gripped Howell because he wasn't really sure what he should do, because he didn't want to bury the body at sea, because people would no doubt accuse him of murdering Griffith when the body washed ashore. So at first, he tried to keep the body in the lighthouse, but with no means to preserve the corpse, obviously it began to decompose, as as corpses will, and the smell would have been absolutely overwhelming. So Howell next decided to build a coffin and obviously having nowhere to bury it he decided to tie it to the rocks so he placed Griffith in the coffin and then continued to man the lighthouse on his own but the trouble was the waves then kept battering the coffin on the rocks breaking it open and Griffith's arm seemed to wave to Howell with the movement of the sea. Now most people think that Howell spent three weeks alone at the lighthouse with just a corpse for company and the isolation and also what had happened badly traumatised him, leaving him almost recognisable by the time his replacements relieved him. And it was after that that it was decided three men needed to man a lighthouse, not two. And obviously because this is a folklore podcast, plenty of stories have grown up around the tragedy and it is difficult to know which ones are likely to be true and which ones are likely to have just been added on later. But in some of the stories, ships pass the lighthouse blithely unaware of the traumatised state of the lone lighthouse keeper. And then in others, boats actually pass close enough to see Griffith's waving arm, but not knowing what they're looking at, they just kind of ignore it and continue. And again, nobody stops to help Howell when he's in this really quite awful position. But as I say, it has become quite a, a famous, if that's the right word, incident in the history of lighthouses and it did at least change the operating procedure so it wasn't enough to help Griffith and it wasn't enough to help Howell but at least it meant that nobody else would be stuck in that situation again or would they because we're going to have a look at the Flannan Islands lighthouse which is in Scotland the Flannan Isles lie in the Outer Hebrides 
and among them lies Elon Moore, where you'll find a remote lighthouse. Now, supernatural goings-on appear in the history of this particular island before we even reach the lighthouse. In St Flannan, a 6th century Irish bishop once built a chapel on the island, but apparently shepherds would let their sheep graze on the island, but they would never spend the night there themselves. Spirits apparently haunted the spot, and nobody wanted to encounter them. But then eventually the lighthouse was built there to obviously help with the passage of ships and so on, and on the 26th of December 1900, Captain James Harvey took Joseph Moore to the lighthouse. They'd had reports that the light had gone out on 15th of December, and by that point the storms had abated so that they could actually go and have a look to see what was going on. They drew near in their vessel, but nobody was waiting for them on the landing platform. Captain Harvey blew the horn and even fired a flare to let the keepers know that they had arrived. When there was still no sign of anyone, Moore left the ship and climbed the steps to the lighthouse, and he later described feelings of foreboding as he did so. He reached the lighthouse and discovered the door unlocked. Only one coat hung in the entrance hall instead of three, and he found half-eaten food and an upturned chair in the kitchen. Apparently the clock had even stopped. He couldn't find the keepers anywhere in the lighthouse. Captain Harvey ordered a search of the islands, yet the missing men had apparently vanished. According to the signs in the lighthouse, they must have been gone for about a week. Only the lighthouse log seemed to yield any clues. One entry on the 12th of December described horrific winds, the quiet mood of the principal keeper, and that an assistant had been crying. The log continued to speak of a violent storm, although they were quite safe in the new lighthouse and no one reported any storms in that area until 17th of December, so nobody could really quite work out why they were quite so worried about this particular storm. And indeed, nobody could work out why it was that William MacArthur, one of the keepers, had gone outside without his oilskin coat, especially in December, because it was his coat that was left behind. And the rules actually forbade all three from leaving their posts at the same time. Eventually, the investigation concluded that the men had been trying to retrieve a supply crate when a wave had washed them out to sea. The smashed open supply box on the western landing platform seemed to explain this and it seemed that two of the keepers had gone out, and when they didn't return, MacArthur had then ventured out. But this explanation didn't cover why he went without his coat, and why no bodies ever washed ashore, and indeed why there were any waves on a sea that was otherwise described as being calm by other people. And nor did it explain the logbook entry from the 15th of December, which said that the storm had passed. There was no mention of any keepers being swept out to sea, so the accident must have happened after someone wrote the entry. But if that was the case, then a wave couldn't have swept them off the rock because by that point the storm had passed and it was a calm sea. Other theories abounded. Some people claimed that the men had left the island to avoid repaying debts. Other people thought they'd been kidnapped by spies or even eaten by a sea serpent. One story saw them kidnapped by a ghost ship's skeletal crew. And since then, keepers have reported hearing voices in the wind, often calling out the names of the missing keepers. Now, Mike Dash did his own investigation and found that the logbook entries might have been a bit of a red herring because they only appeared in the story several years later and Dash discovered that there was no evidence that they'd ever existed in the first place. So some people now think that MacArthur started a fight because apparently that was what he was prone to doing and then all three somehow fell to their deaths. Other people think that he might have killed the other two and then thrown himself into the sea, but there isn't any evidence of a fight or a murder. So it does look that at some point two of them were outside in their coats and then MacArthur went out after them and somehow something similar happened to him as well. But it does remain one of the more enigmatic lighthouse legends and it's one of those kind of unexplained mysteries that people can continue to have theories about even now and nobody will really ever know what happened but it it does still continue to capture people's imagination. Now we're going to move to Ireland now, and we're going to go to County Wexford, where you'll find Hook Lighthouse, which is the world's oldest operation lighthouse. Now some places that I had a look at said that it was the oldest operation lighthouse, other places said it was the second oldest operation lighthouse, so at least it's been going for, for a while. But people disagree over who first built the lighthouse. Popular theories name either Raymond Legrosse, who apparently built a tower here in 1172, or William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, who built the lighthouse in 1245. Marshall indeed was believed to be one of the Knights Templar. But that said, there has been some sort of beacon here since the 5th century. Now, monks actually tended the lighthouse until 1641, when they abandoned it due to the English Civil War, which is sometimes otherwise known as the War of the Three Kingdoms. 
There are rumours that the remains of four monks are entombed in the walls, but I'm not really sure what the evidence for this is. And other folklore claims that only one monk lies within the walls. But again, it's really, really difficult to track down any information about this. And indeed, when I was looking for more information on Hook Lighthouse, the moment you put haunted and Hook Lighthouse into Google, it keeps directing you to nearby Loftus Hall, which is believed to be one of the most haunted places in Ireland. So it was really difficult to tease anything out about Hook Lighthouse. Anyway, Charles II allowed for the restoration of the lighthouse in 1665 when builders both enlarged it and extended it, so it then went from 18 metres to 24 metres tall, and it has been in active use ever since 1667. Now, keepers lived at the lighthouse until 1977, and it was finally automated in 1996. But according to legend, William Marshall still haunts the site, and he's believed to spend time in the tower where he can keep watch, and according to a lot of the stories, he doesn't really the kind of figure who's almost like a residual where he's just still doing his job rather than creating any kind of havoc as we're going to see in the next story. So I like to think that he's kind of still there keeping an eye over the proceedings. But witnesses have also reported watching a monk walking around at the base of the tower. So again, nobody really knows who he is. Is it the monk whose body lies within the walls? You decide. All the websites that I read about the place were really, really complimentary of visiting it though. So if anybody does go to visit Hook Lighthouse, please do let me know what it's like because it looks amazing and it sounds fabulous as well. So that's a little visiting recommendation right there. But we're going to finish up with an English lighthouse and I am going to be massively biased and do Suter Lighthouse because it is in the area I have visited and it stands on Lizard Point in Marsden, some 3.5 miles from the mouth of the River Tyne, so it's to the south, so it's kind of past South Shields if you know the northeast at all. Now the visibility is actually better there than it is at Suter Point, which is a bit further down, but because there was already a Lizard Lighthouse in Cornwall, they ended up calling it Suter Lighthouse, so it's basically standing on the wrong point for the name, but it was purely just because there was already a Lizard Lighthouse. Now, built in 1871, Suter Lighthouse is also the first one ever built for electric power, and it's actually now run by the National Trust, so you can go and visit, and I do also recommend going to visit that as well. Now, Suter is also considered one of the UK's most haunted lighthouses, and I do think there's a simple reason why this might be. But one of the ghosts, and this is why I wanted to include this, is believed to be Isabella Darling, niece of Grace Darling, who we met last week. Now, according to the 1881 and 1891 census records, Isabella did live as Suter, although no one can actually work out why she would haunt the lighthouse. There doesn't really seem to be an obvious story behind that one. If, of course, you, if you do know a reason, then please do let me know. The reason why I said I thought there was one reason why it's considered the most haunted lighthouse is because I want to point out it was Derek Akora, the medium on Most Haunted, who first claimed to contact Isabella in 2002. And if you're outside of the UK and you're unfamiliar with Most Haunted, it's basically one of the forerunners of the kind of programmes like Ghost Hunters and things like that. So you'd essentially have this team of investigators, and I'm using that in the loosest possible term, plus an actual parapsychologist like the fabulous Dr. Karen O'Keefe, and they would go to these different locations and then they would essentially do ghost hunts on telly. And it was hosted by Yvette Fielding, who was this beloved Blue Peter TV presenter, who honestly, she just did not seem well suited at all to a job where you're walking around in the dark and things might suddenly, like like moths, might suddenly fly in your face. But anyway, it was really interesting for getting to learn about the history of places, even if you sometimes ignored some of what happened in them. Derek was perhaps one of the more famous of the mediums that they used and there would be many a time he would say he was speaking to a so and such person and then there would be a message on the bottom of the screen saying that there was no record of anyone of that name associated with the place. Bless him. But he was the one who claimed to make contact with Isabella Darling. There doesn't seem to be any previous records of hauntings being associated with her before Derek comes along. And he claimed that Isabella enjoyed actually creating the activity that was going on and then watching the expressions of those present. And if true, that is quite a cool thing to add to a ghost, like not only a sense of agency, but a sense of enjoyment of that agency as well. You can actually watch the episode on archive.org as well, which is quite funny. But the activity around the lighthouse is fairly varied and it reaches from temperature drops to objects floating through the air. There is a bell somewhere near the kitchen, or at least there used to be, and people used to report here and that being wrong. Visitors report here and their names called and then turn around and there's no one there. And other people have actually seen a young girl around the place, which some people think may be Isabella, but again, I suppose it would depend how old she was when she was there. 
One waitress apparently saw a man in a late housekeeper uniform who just completely vanished in front of her. People have also reported smelling tobacco smoke in the kitchen corridor and it also lingers in the recreation of the keeper's cottage. So there is quite a lot of activity associated with the place. So, you know, I can see why they would do it on Most Haunted. But I actually did a ghost hunt at Suter Lighthouse back in 2011 and this is another reason I wanted to include it because not that much really happened on the hunt itself other than a lot of table tipping experiments and Ouija boards. And obviously Ouija boards can be manipulated But the one thing that was really interesting was there was this unexplained bang on the inside of a locked door. And I was standing right beside it when it happened and the door actually had a window in it so you could see into the room. And there was nobody like on the inside of the door to make the bang. It just kind of came out of nowhere. So that was really weird because there was obviously no one in there and there was nowhere for anyone to hide. And it just really, really loud. So that was odd. But other than that, we didn't really experience a huge amount of activity that you'd necessarily write home about. So I think its haunted reputation does seem to come and go, but it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest for the entire area to have some sort of psychic thumbprint. Now, like Hooker Lighthouse, Suter Lighthouse does actually stand on the mainland. It's not separated by a causeway or anything or far out to sea like the other two are. So Suter then has these links with the nearby beach at Marsden where there are caves that were once used by smugglers. And of course there were so many shipwrecks in one place you feel like that's bound to create some kind of disturbance in the psychic atmosphere. And while Suter doesn't have the same isolated feel as Flannan Isles or the Smalls, it, it does have a more of a feel of being industrious and lived in in a way that almost helps contribute to the legends because it feels a little bit more accessible, so I guess more people potentially visit. I don't know, but it is quite an interesting place to visit if you do get the chance. So what do we ultimately make of these lighthouse legends? Well, I think the idea that would have ghost stories at lighthouses doesn't surprise me in the slightest because, like I say, they're usually isolated. Even when they're on the mainland like Hook and Suter, they're still some distance away from habitation. They're usually in areas linked with violence or loss of life through the likes of shipwrecks and so on. Lighthouse keepers obviously face incredibly harsh conditions in very inhospitable places quite a lot of the time. And when we visit lighthouses now, they're devoid of life thanks to automation. And I feel like that almost makes it a bit easier to then peer through the past into echoes of the past lives of these lighthouses. But I think the legend of the small tragedy shows just how unwelcoming these places could actually be. And obviously the mystery of the Flannan Islands remains unsolved, so with men going missing and corpses beckoning to their colleagues, our imaginations can easily run riot. But creepy or not, lighthouses did and still do provide a life-saving function, even with the invention of the likes of GPS and stuff like that. And for that, I think that we should be truly grateful to them. So what I'd like to know is, are there any lighthouses near you? And if so, are there any tales associated with them? And if you'd like to share them, feel free. You can either post on the comment of the blog post that this is attached to, or you can also drop a comment in if you're watching on YouTube just below the video. And it'd be quite cool to kind of collect some of them together as well. So it would be really interesting to hear some of your lighthouse legends as well. Now, next week for our final episode of Folklore of the Sea, we are going to be having a look at the folklore attached to plants associated with the sea and kind of beach plants and things like that, because I've never really covered any of them before. So that should be quite an interesting one. So if you like the plant based episodes, then definitely tune in next week as well. And I've been putting other bonuses up on Patreon as well. So if you would like access to any of that exclusive content, then you can gain access by becoming a member of the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon. And obviously the financial support does help me keep the podcast going. But without any further ado, I will bid you a good week ahead. Stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll see you next week. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.